The best way to support the Daily Tech News Show is on Patreon. Did somebody cough? Wasn't me. Oh, sorry. That was me. Mm. <laughs> Sounded like a little dog. <laughs> All right. Starting over in three, two. The best way to support the Daily Tech News Show is on Patreon. Anna Balash has supported us that way for five years. Join Anna and get more at patreon.com slash DTNS. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, July 15th, 2019. I'm Tom Merritt. And back at Studio Feline, I'm Sarah Lane. And uh, I'm Roger Chang, the sweating producer. <laughs> <laughs> We're actually all in Los Angeles and therefore all sweaty. Uh, you don't need to know that. We're going to keep you cool <laughs> with the important tech news of the day. Uh, this is one of those days where we are going to give you the things you need to know to sound smarter in the room. They may not be the craziest, weirdest, clickbaity headlines out there, but you're going to be better informed because of them. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. After more than a year, the Republic of Chad has restored internet access to social networks, including Facebook and Twitter. More than a year. The blocks were put into place in March of 2018 following political protests. The Economic Times reports Apple has stopped selling the iPhone SE, 6, 6 Plus, and 6S Plus in India. That means the entry-level price of an iPhone in India is now about 8,000 rupees higher because you can't get those entry-level phones anymore. Apple raised revenue in India in 2018 and 2019 despite lower volume, leading to an apparent focus on value over number of units. They're just going to lean into being a premium supplier in India. Console Mac reports that the newest MacBook Air, which was announced last week, has a slower SSD than the 2018 model, with write speeds slightly faster, but read speeds about 35% slower, which likely relates to that MacBook Air also getting a $100 price discount. Console Mac used Blackmagic speed disk speed test on the new Air, hit speeds of 1.3 gigabits per second read and 1 gigabit per second write. The 2018 MacBook Air achieved 2 gigabits gigabits per second read and 0.9 gigabits per second write. All right, let's talk a little bit about the new Qualcomm SOC system on a chip, not thing you put on your foot. Qualcomm announced the Snapdragon 855 Plus SOC, which features higher clock speeds than the existing Snapdragon 855 that isn't called Plus. Uh, the Snapdragon 855 Plus is targeted at gaming and VR. It includes the eight-core Cryo 485 CPU with the main core clocked up to 2.96 gigahertz, paired with an Adreno 640 graphics card that Qualcomm claims will be 15% faster than the standard 855's graphic card. The SOC will only have 4G on board, so 5G will need a separate modem if you're going to get this in a 5G phone. The Snapdragon 855 Plus will be available soon, with Asus confirming it will be in the upcoming ROG Phone 2, the Republic of Gaming Phone 2. That's coming July 23rd. And the Galaxy Note 10, coming August 7th, is likely to use this system on a chip as well. We are, uh, we're, this is not a huge update, but it's kind of big news right now because it's going to show up in phones soon and it's going to provide a little more power for gaming. Uh, I think a lot of people are surprised that it won't have 5G built in, but it doesn't mean it can't be in a 5G phone. It just means that phone's going to have to have a separate modem part uh, for that. I would assume Qualcomm eventually to have this kind of power upgrade with a 5G modem built in. Uh, but But for now, not that many people need the 5G phone anyway. And your Note 10, I think, could take good advantage of this little power boost. Absolutely. Well, I don't know, Tom, Roger, or anybody out there, if you use Twitter for the desktop. I do not, but a lot of people do. And Twitter has decided to roll out a new desktop version to the public that uses it that includes a new left-hand sidebar that points to things like notifications, direct messages, explore, bookmarks, lists, and the like. Direct messages in particular feels a little bit more like an inbox, at least in you know, uh, compared to what it was before, where you can view and respond to conversations all in one place. Profile switching, support for more themes, and advanced search all got updates as well. And it's rolling out now. I, Tom, I don't know if you, you're seeing it yet, but I am not. I have not seen it yet. I'm going to reload right now. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of... Changed. I reloaded right before. No, it has not changed. It. Uh, not for me. But I have to say, uh, the first thing that struck me about this was it reminded me of how Netflix added a left side bar to its <laughs> Apple TV app uh, and, and and a bunch of its, of its apps. And I think for a long time, designers of UI, of UX 
uh, we're trying to avoid the sidebar, the left sidebar. And uh, it just seems to be coming back into vogue now. Like, you know what? We give up. I guess the left, the left side nav is not going away. Uh, it does and and, look and a what was that really in favor of? Just drop down so that you could increase your real estate on the left side I mean, and put yeah, something else there, look, right? Because yeah. this is a cluttered feel. This this new look, when you look at the the screenshots of it, I'm like, oh yeah, there's not a lot of room for the tweets in the middle. Yeah. But navigationally, it is a lot easier to see the things that you need to choose versus when you just had like two or three options across the top in the older uh, version. Then, you know, like with tabs, uh, sometimes when you wanted to find something, you had to guess which one of those tabs or or which actual nav option it was hidden in. So they, they've pulled some stuff out of the more section and, and put it in the left side nav, which is good, like for finding direct messages now. And I think the, you know, the fact that direct messages is beefed up is great, but uh, it, it, it's funny. Both the direct message screen and the Twitter home screen are more cluttered. The direct mm -hmm. message screen being, being more cluttered is a good thing to me because it's like, oh, now it feels more like a messaging a handling system. Yeah, right. exactly. It it well, it sort of reminds me, and and I know Twitter has its own agenda here, but it reminds me of Facebook's recent messaging about Messenger and the the fact that they understand the company understands that not everything needs to be public and there's you know private private group chats going on and and Twitter's direct messages has supported group chatting as well for some time and. If Twitter knows, and they do, whether or not we're all using DMs, I don't use them very often, but I think if it was a better experience overall, I might use it the way that I use Instagram direct messaging for whatever reason. That's something that, you know, is pretty prolific in my friend group. So yeah, it, it, it makes sense that Twitter's like, hey, we got all these features, right? We might as well throw them at everybody, make it more prominent, at least for the people who are using the desktop. Yeah, I have a lot of people, especially people outside the United States who use direct message uh, to communicate. And, and and so having that work better on the desktop is great. Uh, I think the other interesting thing is they have hidden moments. Moments has now moved into the more menu. Uh, so I would expect moments to eventually go away, yeah. but they prioritized explore, which is trying to show you more things they think you will be interested in. Uh, which, you know, the curse of the algorithm, right? It's that That's always a little dicey if it's putting you in a bubble or something. But I, I'll, I've never used Moments or Explore, um, so I don't think it's going to change my own personal use, but it might, it might change the experience for a lot of people. I'd also like to know, just out of curiosity, if anybody wants to write in, uh, if, if you prefer desktop Twitter, why? Because I specifically just use Mac apps whenever I can. I've been using TweetBot forever, so there are so many Twitter features that I... I know about because we talk about it on the show, but I don't actually have because I'm using a third party app. But I, yeah, I'd love to know if uh, what you know, what about the desktop experience uh, is advantageous? Yeah. And I'll add to that. Uh, tweet deck users like myself uh, chime in as well. It'd be interesting. Yeah. Facebook's David Marcus posted his prepared testimony in advance of his appearance before the U.S. Senate on Tuesday and the U.S. House on Wednesday. Marcus says the Libra Association has no intention of competing with sovereign currencies, no intention of entering into monetary policy. The Libra Association plans to register as a money services business with the Treasury Department's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network and will comply with anti-money laundering laws and the Bank Secrecy Act rules. So they're saying all the right things. We want to be a, you know, chuck cashing place, essentially. Uh, we don't want to be a bank. Marcus also said that Libra will not hold personal data beyond transaction info and personal info provided to Facebook's Calibra wallet, which remember is a separate thing from the Libra Association, will not be shared with the social network or used for ad targeting. We have talked about the fact that you could opt to change that, we think, but we'll see how Calibra rolls out. Right now, he's emphasizing that by default, Calibra won't share information with Facebook. The Libra Association is headquartered in Geneva and will therefore follow Swiss federal data protection regulations for its privacy policies. Uh, so you know what? I, I have a feeling all of this is going to be lost on the people asking the questions over the next two days, because already ahead of the testimony, U.S. House Democrats are considering a bill called the Keep Big Tech Out of Finance Act. The wording is highly targeted to make Libra illegal. 
or at least to make Facebook's participation in it illegal. Uh, it's still being finalized. It has not been introduced, but the current wording would ban platforms with global revenue of more than $25 billion or more from becoming or being affiliated with a financial institution. So $25 billion or more, well, there's a handful of companies that meet that. And among those, the ones trying to be affiliated with a financial institution in the form of being a member of the 27 or 28 people running the Libra Association, there is one, Facebook. So this bill would target Facebook the way it is currently worded. Uh, a platform is defined as offering to the public an online marketplace, an exchange, or a platform for connecting third parties. Uh, TechCrunch speculated that might apply to PayPal at some point, but it doesn't make $25 billion or more. So at this point, it doesn't. Really does seem like all the House and Senate want to do is make Libra Association not happen. Yeah, I think it's a combination of, from what I can see, a combination of people saying, I don't understand this and therefore I am frightened by it. And then you've got the other camp of, you know, keep big tech out of finance. You know, those little finance guys, they, you know, <laughs> don't, ru staffs. don't run over the financial institutions. It's, it's, it, there, there are, there, there's a lot of incentive uh, from people who work in finance to say, everything's fine. Why would you want to recreate this? Nothing is wrong with the way that currency works now. There is there is no reason that that tech should be involved, and you know that that is super short sighted. I, I think my best guess is we're going to hear a lot of very uninformed questions over the next two days that don't get to the heart of the matter, that don't get to the actual issues of how will this be used? Uh, will it in fact help the unbanked? If you don't have enough money uh, to have a bank account now, how are you going to buy your Libra? Uh, I would like to hear a lot more. That Marcus has done a few interviews on that topic, but that's what I'd like to hear him talk about don't think that's what we're going to hear. We're going to hear a lot of grandstanding that allows an elected representative to campaign on the the people who uh, leaked uh, your information and swung the election against whoever you wanted to win. Uh, I want to get into money and we're going to stop them. That, that's really the message that the elected representatives want to get out there. And it's in contradiction to what I think the Libra Association is actually trying to do. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I don't really know how Libra will or will not affect my life because I don't have the opportunity to use it yet in any capacity. There's a there's a lot that Facebook kind of isn't saying yet, and I think that that's by design. So I understand the confusion on a, on a certain level, but to say, well, this is you know this is just going to be a whole thing for criminals is yeah. is that's 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 not true either. It's Prime Day for protests, everybody. See what we did there? 2,000 workers are on strike at seven Amazon stores in Germany with the slogan, no more discount on our incomes. And a six-hour stoppage is being conducted in an Amazon site in Minnesota as well. We talked about that on Friday. Leafletting and protest organized, but the GMB union uh, and the, at the GMB union are happening at several Amazon sites in the UK as well. Amazon says its pay and working conditions compare favorably to similar businesses and doesn't expect the protest to impact deliveries. And Gadget's Nicole Lee has her story on the Minnesota Amazon strike up, as she mentioned, she talked about it a little bit. She was our guest on Friday, and we spoke with her a little bit more about it at the time. So, you know, the fact that it's Prime Day is, is it's, it's just one of many stories about this. Yeah, seven Amazon, I don't know if they're all warehouses uh, or, or storage locations, but they're, they're certainly locations with, with you know, warehouse type workers, uh, unionized workers uh, on strike in Germany is a smaller percentage of the number of people employed by Amazon in Germany. So it's it's more of sending a message, uh, you know, as Amazon says, they don't expect this to impact deliveries. Uh, this, this is about optics just as much as the House and Senate uh, interviewing David Marcus is. They're trying to say, we don't think Amazon is treating us well. Amazon says, no, we treat you great. What are you talking about? Uh, I, I don't expect this to really have any impact on Amazon's big sale that they're operating right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is an indication that uh, the workers are unhappy and there, there's enough of them unhappy to, to cause some protests around the world in various locations. So it's it's a problem that's not just going to go away, right? Well, this is also, uh, protests work this way. Right now, yeah, they, I actually ordered something same day on Amazon that I needed because I had been traveling and I needed a certain cable that I left up in Sonoma and, you know, it came within a couple hours. Great. Uh, so there are many reasons that uh, Amazon works w wonderfully for me, especially in a pinch. But if enough workers struck, then it would be a problem on Prime Day because it, but because this is something that 
gets a lot of hype and the company, you know, tries to kind of turn into, you know, a holiday of sorts and it gets a lot of attention. And yeah, if you don't have your workforce, you, you, you can't execute it. Yeah. And by the way, um, if you're wondering like, why aren't we talking about the sale? Cause we don't want to do a commercial for Amazon. Uh, it kind of disheartens me every year at this time when, uh, everybody does stories about the deals, uh, there, there, there are certain uh, outlets that that's their that's their thing, right? Like CNET yeah. had a columnist who talked about deals. And of course, that columnist is going to talk about any deals that are happening any given day, including today. Uh, but it just, it, it does feel like there's a lot more light than heat around this sale. Uh, and, and so because of that, I think that's why you're seeing the worker protests focused on this day because there's all this hype about, around it. And, and of course, like you said, it may not be big now, but this is how it starts. Mm -hmm. Some US TV stations have started broadcasting in what's called ATSC 3.0, which among other things supports 4K broadcasts with HDR at up to 120 frames per second over the air. Put up an antenna, plug it into your TV, get some 4K broadcast over the air right here in the good old US of A. It also collects information on viewing habits from your net connected TV and can remotely turn on your TV for emergency broadcasts. Uh, both of those have received some controversy. It's easy to get away from the tracking because you have to have some kind of internet connected device to send the tracking back to the broadcaster. Uh, so if you just don't have a net connected TV, you're fine. Or if your new tuner doesn't have a net connection on, then you would be fine. I guess they could play some bad ball and make you have an internet connection for the tuner to work, but it doesn't seem like that's gonna be a, the case. Uh, the remotely turning on the TV creeps some people out, but as long as it really is only used for emergency broadcasts, I'm, not, I'm fine with that. Antennas will be able to receive it right now. If you've got an HD antenna, you'll be able to get the 4K broadcast too. However, it's not backwards compatible with ATSC 1.0 tuners, which is what everybody has had since the digital TV transition a decade ago. So you'll have to get a new TV or a new tuner if you want to take advantage of these new broadcasts. And there aren't any available yet. Uh, the new ATSC 3.0 tuners aren't expected until next year. Meantime, stations that are broadcasting in ATSC 3.0 have to continue to also broadcast in ATSC 1.0 for at least five years. The expectation is most of them will broadcast for longer than that because they know a big portion of their audience are going to continue to just use the older mm -hmm. tuners. And yeah. this isn't like the digital TV transition where the government's going to step in and subsidize tuners and all of that. Uh, so I would imagine we'll get 1.0 broadcast for a lot longer than five years. But if you want the 4K HDR broadcast starting next year, you'll be able to get a tuner. And they're already starting to test these broadcasts so that they'll be there for you when you do. I So I've got an OTA antenna. I, I, I watch a fair amount of network TV that way and they are hd broadcasts and i don't know yeah like what 4k content would even be in that package eventually i wouldn't even want it i wouldn't care That's well great. over the air broadcast right like yeah. so if you wanted to watch the 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 mass singer in 8 4k you'll be able to okay yeah i guess there's certain or, or Wimbledon, right? I mean, you know, maybe you just want to see that graph. Like, on the ABC, crisper crisper yeah. than ever, yeah, kind of thing. Late broadcast would have been in 4K. Yeah, but... that, okay. So there, there are some exceptions. But it also sounds like <laughs> I don't have to panic for at least five years. Yeah. Uh, it, but no, I probably longer, but yeah, yeah. I, I, I say this is for the person who wants to early adopt. It'll be yeah. out there next year. And it's good to know that the TV stations are starting to broadcast. I think 40 major market stations have committed to starting their 3.0 broadcasts by the end of this year. So you should have lots of broadcasts available once you do buy a tuner, if you choose to buy a tuner. Cool. To get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. A lot of Huawei news happened uh, over the weekend and today. Uh, so I'm going to try to combine all of that for you into a digestible form so you can be up to date. Uh, the most recent, a senior U.S. official telling Reuters that the U.S. may approve licenses for companies to sell to Huawei in as soon as two weeks. Uh, we had the president saying they would start approving it. And then last week, U.S. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross said the licenses would be issued if there is no threat to national security. Uh, so providing parts for phones, that kind of thing, uh, it would, would be allowed, one would expect. Now we know within two weeks, they're going to start approving these, uh, uh, these licenses. Reuters sources indicated that two chip companies, a customer response management company, and a firm that simulates cross-sectional radar 
for Huawei are among the companies filing applications. You can expect more to file uh, as this becomes apparent. Meanwhile, sources tell Wall Street Journal that Huawei is preparing to lay off hundreds of workers from its U.S. subsidiary FutureWay. Uh, FutureWay is in the Silicon Valley. It's a research and development subsidiary. And Chinese employees of FutureWay are apparently going to be offered a chance to transfer back home to China. Uh, but it looks like FutureWay is going to be shut down and there will be no Huawei R&D happening in Silicon Valley. Huawei has previously said it increased revenue in the first half of this year. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out when they announce their first half numbers on July 30th. And then 5G. Whoa, lots to say about 5G. Last week, Monaco launched its 5G network using Huawei equipment. Remember, there's been a lot of pressure from the U.S. to get especially European nations not to use Huawei equipment. Huawei announced it will invest $3.1 billion in Italy over the next three years, as long as Italy ensures that its new rules on state intervention of 5G networks, and they just passed a decree saying the state can step in and prevent some equipment, if it's a security problem, from being used in building 5G networks in Italy. Huawei said, we'll invest $3.1 billion in Italy as long as you apply that decree to everybody. They want it to be transparent, efficient, and fair. They want all vendors to be uh, subjects to this decree. They don't want it to be just targeted at them. Uh, and of course, Telecom Italia and Vodafone Italia are expected to jointly roll out 5G infrastructure in Italy. So the pressure will be on them as to what they buy and whether they're going to try to invoke this decree or whether they would tempt invoking the decree, I guess. In a letter from the chair of the UK Science and Technology Committee to the UK's digital minister, Jeremy Wright, the committee says, we have found no evidence from our work to suggest that the complete exclusion of Huawei from the UK's telecommunications networks would, from a technical point of view, constitute a proportionate response to the potential security threat proposed by foreign suppliers. In other words, you can use Huawei equipment. We don't think it would be proportional to ban it. It's not that much of a threat. However, it does recommend the exclusion of Huawei equipment from the core of 5G networks and recommends that Huawei equipment be restricted if Huawei does not address security competence. Remember, we talked about on DTNS, the Huawei Oversight Board uh, report said, Huawei isn't uh, a an intentional security problem. However, they aren't very good at cybersecurity and they don't seem to be making progress on patching their pretty mundane vulnerabilities. Uh, and so this letter says, you're fine to use Huawei equipment, don't use it in the core. And if they don't improve on patching their vulnerabilities, then we might change our minds. I got to say, I love Monaco being like, launched 5G. Here we are. We're Monaco. You know how many people live in Monaco? Not very many. It's a very small region. It's hard to compare it to a lot of other countries. But yeah, I mean, and, and yeah, lots to unpack here. Um, I eight thousand six hundred ninety-five people lived in Monaco in twenty seventeen. How many? Thirty-eight thousand. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 sort of well, I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's it's a it's a really small, uh, little 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 independent nation, but um, uh, but next to Italy. Uh, so yeah, I I I don't know the layoffs um from Huawei's R and D subsidiary FutureWay. That is interesting to me. Kind of came out of nowhere. Maybe not for some of you, but I had not heard of it before. Uh, I wasn't familiar with what was going on there, uh, and it kind of makes sense that there are there. They're just going to have to be some changes, particularly in the Silicon Valley area, and that might even be a trend that we see more of um, from companies that aren't uh, based in the U.S. Well, you may not remember it as FutureWay, but we did talk about on the show before the fact that uh, the U.S. employees of Huawei were ordered not to talk to the rest of their employees. In other words, okay, FutureWay employees don't talk to anyone in China. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. That's, that's them, right? So this, this is kind of like just throwing the baby and the bathwater out saying, you know what, instead of trying to wall off our R and D, you're just going to get rid of it. Even if the restrictions are easing, because don't forget these licenses are being issued or going to be issued within the next couple of weeks, but they're not issued forever. Uh, sure. this, this is sort of a temporary easing to see how things go. And the licenses could be revoked again. We could go through this whole dance again, yeah. uh, in a few months. 
Thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. Wallaway stories show up there regularly, as well as others. You can submit your own stories that you think might be good for the show and good for the community and vote on others at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. We're also on Facebook. Join our group if you haven't already. Facebook.com slash groups slash Daily Tech News Show. All right, let's check in with Chris Christensen, the amateur traveler, who's sharing a bit on airport navigation for the blind. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech in Travel Minute. Great story out of Travel Pulse. A professor out of Carnegie Mellon who's been blind since 14 has launched a navigation app for his local airport, for the Pittsburgh airport, that lets blind people navigate the airport with audio feedback. It works like an indoor GPS allows you to do everything from finding the gate to find a gift shop or a cafe or just wandering around for a bit. It's not the only app out there like that. Apparently, Louisville International in Kentucky has a similar app, but a great use of technology. I'm Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler. Thank you, Chris. That's good, good accessibility stuff uh, to know. And if anybody's using this, uh, let us know. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com, how well it works for you. Let's check out the mailbag, speaking of. Let's do it. Michael, who writes in from what he says is overcast and unseasonally cool Yokohama. Michael says, you talked about Amazon recently offering retraining for staff and programming and other fields. Having worked in a Japanese software firm for 15 years, it came as a shock to me how few people we hired for software development had studied programming at the university level or anywhere for that matter before joining us. And we had some really good programmers. Everyone who's hired is trained to do the thing that they're hired to do. One advantage to this method is that we had around half male, half female programming staff. When it doesn't matter, when you studied before, anyone can do any task, male or female. So numbers don't get skewed by what's so popular to study. The guy who graduated in marketing is trained alongside the gal who studied education, for example. The purpose of education is to learn how to learn. The company is going to train you in the task you need to do for them. And they'll continue with the training up through the ranks of management. My first two supervisors leading the development teams were the female seniors of the department. This was how everything worked back in the 1990s and the early 2000s. LinkedIn and other Western influence may have changed that dynamic over the past decade. But if the factory worker wants to train to become a software developer and has the work ethic and ability to learn, I don't see why training in a different field won't work. Most of our best programmers and later managers haven't, hadn't even used a computer before joining our company. Now I already know somebody's going to write in and 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 say, you know, my experience in Japan is not that much gender equality. Uh, and I, I and while Michael I think is trying to make a point about one of the benefits of this way of doing things, uh, I don't think his point was that Japan has perfect gender equality. I think his point was it was an interesting way for him to experience the idea yeah. of you don't have to have gone to school in engineering or programming to get a job as a programmer. And maybe what Amazon's doing, even though it's different, Amazon's saying, we'll, we'll pay to retrain you. You pick what you want, go train it. And if you want a job back at Amazon, great, but you don't have to. Uh, that's a little different than what Michael's talking about. But there is the point of saying, hey, anybody could potentially do anything if they're interested and show enough talent to be able to learn it. Uh, and so I, I'm curious if there are other people who worked in Japan in that same era, 90s through the early 2000s, who had uh, similar experiences. And I know we have several listeners in Japan. Uh, let us know if you think that uh, it's no longer like that, uh, or, or, or never was like that. Uh, if you, if you think that, uh, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. But I love, I love this insight from Michael. Thank you, Michael, uh, for sending it to us because the idea of saying, we just want smart people and then we'll train them to do the job we want could be a way to help overcome the challenges of automation and displacement of workers. Hmm. What industry uses that? Hmm. Could it be media? <laughs> <laughs> anybody in media will tell you. Oh, you like, most we'll of the hire people anyone. Who, yeah. yeah. Well, we'll hire anybody who's smart and wants to do the job. Like yeah. we don't care what kind of degree you have. I have a broadcast degree, but I mean, does that matter? Nope. Actually, that's funny because the three <laughs> of us working on this independent show all have uh, journalism degrees. Right. Right. I know, but it, but it, it is uh, increasingly uncommon. Yeah. So there you go. That's what happens if you have a journalism degree. You just end up going off on your own because you learned how to do, you learn the principles of it, and you're like, yeah, I can just do this myself. Um, Shaking your fist, Oxford comma. <laughs> That's just me. Uh, <laughs> thanks uh, to all of our patrons. Uh, you make the show. Uh, you help uh, uh, those of us with journalism degrees do what we love to do every day. 
Yeah, well, we're doing a survey uh, right now. Uh, if you go to dailytechnewsshow.com slash survey, uh, you can find it and uh, click through to the, the Google form and let us know what you think. It helps us improve the show. And one of the things we're asking people is like, what is compelling about Patreon? So far, a lot of the answers are just being able to support the show. And, and we love that uh, because really, if you do become a member, we try to give you some cool perks. Uh, but the fact that you actually are directly our bosses and we respond to you is what we like most about that model. So please, uh, first of all, go take the survey, whether you're a patron or not, dailytechnewsshow.com slash survey. And of course, uh, support us at patreon.com slash DTNS. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. If you want to contribute, let us know what your thoughts are. Get it off your chest. We're also live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young on a Tuesday because Patrick Beige is on vacation and Justin's leaving on Thursday. We'll talk to you then. Wrong sting. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>